This hearing will uh, come to order. I want to thank the witnesses and our guests and thank my good colleague, Mr. Ehlers, ranking member. Our um, subcommittee on research and uh, science uh, education uh, committee is interested in hearing from educators in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, uh, STEM fields, uh, about their experiences working with federal R&D mission agencies. This hearing is part of our ongoing effort, led by Chairman Gordon, uh, that the committee is undertaking to determine how to improve the level of scientific understanding of students in the U.S. and how to attract more students to careers in science and engineering. There have been at least a half dozen reports released over the past 20 years documenting how American students have fallen behind students in other countries. The National Academies report, Rising Above the Gathering Storm, warned us that this will threaten the standing of our country in the future. The authors of that uh, our, uh, paper wrote, in quotes, the scientific and technological building blocks critical to our economic leadership are eroding at a time when many other nations are gathering strength. They recommended, they being the authors, recommended that the highest priority should be a vast improvement of science and mathematics education in this country in order to increase the number of students interested in and prepared in their careers in STEM fields. The Science and Technology Committee held a hearing in March with leading voices in private industry and higher education to discuss research and education needs in STEM fields. Every one of the witnesses, including a retired CEO of Lockheed Martin, the current CEO of McGraw-Hill, the CEO of Intel, and the president of the Council on Competitiveness, testified that companies in America need a workforce well-trained in STEM fields in order to continue the innovative solutions that keep them profitable. The committee has taken this advice to heart. H.R. 362, also known as 10,000 Teachers, 10 Million Minds, Science and Math Scholarship Act, was introduced by Chairman Gordon earlier this year. The bill implements most of the K-12 through education recommendations of the Gathering Storm Report and was passed by the House with strong bipartisan support last month. The Research and Science Education Subcommittee will next be exploring ways that federal efforts in STEM education can be better focused and more effective. This is the first in a planned series of hearings to address these issues. Today we're reviewing the role of the federal R&D mission agencies in improving STEM education. Specifically, we're referring to NASA, NOAA, NIST, EPA, and the Department of Energy. I believe there's a great deal of untapped potential residing in the expertise of scientists and engineers at these agencies. Not only do these science and engineers possess impressive content knowledge of the sciences, they also have real-world experience with the wow factor that gets kids excited about learning science. Space travel, discovering new forms of ocean light, creating uh, renewable energy sources, improving air and water quality, testing bulletproof vests, we could list hundreds of more activities that make science and math captivating to young people. Although the agencies have made commendable efforts to share their knowledge and passion for science with students, I believe those efforts have been relatively small and have varied widely in their methods, target audiences, and methods of evaluation. The programs have been developed independently, independently and without a strategic plan for accomplishing a common set of goals and objectives. With a unified effort, I'm convinced these programs could have a much bigger impact on approximately 52 million K-12 students in America. So we've asked our witnesses today to tell us about their experience as participants in these programs. We've asked them to respond to a series of questions. What do the agencies do well? What should they improve? Which program do educators consider successful? And how do they define that success? The committee is devoted to improving science education, so devoted that we've added science education to the name of this subcommittee. We're very concerned that American students are not achieving their potential in science and math education. It's a concern not only as we look at competing in a knowledge-based global economy, but also when we look at access to high-paying technology-based jobs in this country. I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses and recognize my friend and colleague, Ranking Member Dr. Ehlers. Thank you very much, Chairman Baird. And I do apologize to you and to the group for uh, my delayed arrival. I was speaking at another session, and unfortunately, I ended up being the last speaker. And even though it was difficult for me, I did cut my word short, <laughs> but, uh, but I was still late. I am pleased today that we have a, a cadre of consumers of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, better known as STEM, educational programs across the federal agencies before us to hear about their experiences. I believe it is the desire of all members of the Science and Technology Committee that we support the implementation of programs that are well designed and effective. But often as legislators, we are so distant from the final imp implementation of the programs that we hear little about personal, personal challenges and personal successes. And this is an opportunity for us to hear 
what some of our ground schemes have resulted in and hear it from the people who are sort of the boots on the ground in the STEM education battle. Today's hearing will delve into what was happening with the consumers of federal STEM agency programs. And I might mention many of these programs don't come directly from this committee. There are a number of federal agencies that instigate their own programs without congressional direction. And I have worried for some years about how those all intertwine with each other and with what we have passed. While each of our panelists brings unique perspectives to the table today, I note there, that there are a few common themes running through your prepared testimony. Several of you have identified the federal science and technology workforce and facilities as underutilized resources for K-16 classrooms. I'm interested to learn more about programs that successfully resource, pardon me, successfully leverage these resources. Secondly, many of you remarked that the best programs are those that excite and inform teachers and students. Finally, your testimony, coupled with the recent release of the Academic Competitiveness Council's report on federal STEM programs, emphasizes a need to reduce the number of programs that are not evaluated or clearly do not provide a benefit to teachers and students. Alternatively, faced with a maze of resources, you need help identifying programs that have been evaluated as successful to know what may be useful to you. Our challenge in Congress is to target limited federal funds at programs which lever leverage relevant federal resources and also complement the local education requirement. Today we will have achieved a win-win scenario to pr promote STEM literacy at all levels if we manage to do that. I'm particularly pleased to see that today's panel includes Michael Lack. As an Einstein Fellow in my office from 1999 to 2000, Michael proud provided extremely valuable insight to me on STEM education and science policy. He has moved on to much grander things, now directing the math and science curricula for the entire Chicago public school system. He has been an outspoken pioneer for effective teaching in math and science from the time that he started teaching high school science through the Teach for America program. Granted, I will allow that I am a little biased since Michael is a physicist by training, but I have been told by others that he is an exceptional teacher, one that others teachers look up to as an example that they aspire to be. We are fortunate to have him here with us today. Welcome, Michael. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Ehlers. If there are other members who wish to submit additional opening statements, the statements will be added to the record. At this time, I'd like to introduce the witnesses on the panel. Ms. Linda Froschauer is uh, the president of National Science Teachers Association. She's also the K-12 Science Department Chair for the Western Public Schools in uh, Western Connecticut. It's good to have you with us again. We always value your remarks and insights. Uh, Mr. Michael Lack is the president of Mathematics and Science for Chicago Public Schools. Apart from being a physicist, he's a very fine individual. Dr. George D. Nelson is uh, <laughs> director of the Science, Mathematics, and Technology. Please don't put that in the record. <laughs> so, chairman's humor. Uh, it's already Dr. there. <laughs> Dr. George D. Nelson is the Director of Science, Mathematics, and Technology Education and is a Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Western Washington University, uh, my home state. He's a former NASA astronaut and flew on the space shuttle. Uh, Mr. Van Reiner is the President of Maryland Science Center and formerly was President of the Sparrow Point Division of Bethlehem Steel. And Dr. Iris Weiss is President of Horizon Research Incorporated, which specializes in mathematics and science education and research evaluation. As you can see, a very distinguished and well-qualified uh, uh, panel for us today to learn from. I would remind our witnesses, uh, first of all, we've all had a chance to look at your written testimony. Thank you for pre preparing that. Uh, some of it quite lengthy, and but very, very informative. But I would remind you that today, for the purpose of testimony, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each. Uh, there are little lights there that will come on, and uh, as Dr. Aders used to remind people, after the red light comes on, you have about five seconds of a chair. Uh, a trapdoor appears underneath your chair, and you disappear from sight. Uh, after which, members of the subcommittee will have five minutes each to ask questions. This is a collegial, friendly atmosphere, so we very much look forward to a good exchange of ideas. And uh, with that, we'll start with Ms. Froshar. 
Thank you for this opportunity to present testimony on behalf of the National Science Teachers Association. My name is Linda Froshar and I'm the president of NSTA. For 32 years I've been a science teacher, currently teaching 8th grade science and I'm department chair at Weston Middle School in Connecticut. This is the second opportunity I've had in recent months to testify before this subcommittee. A few weeks ago, I appeared in support of HR 524, which is the Partnerships for Access to Laboratory Science Grants. I want to sincerely thank the members of the Science Committee in the House for passing this extremely important legislation as part of HR 362. Today, I'd like to talk about federal STEM education programs for K-12 teachers. As you know, the vast majority of STEM education programs are generated from the U.S. Department of Education and the National Science Foundation. We consider the NSF to be the engine of innovation for K-12 STEM education. Information about NSF initiatives and other federal STEM education programs are promoted extensively through NSTA print and online channels and on the NSTA website. Combined, these communication vehicles reach hundreds of thousands of teachers, teacher leaders, and others in the science education community. Federal agencies also share information about programs for science educators at the NSTA conferences, which draw approximately 12,000 teachers each year. During the last NSTA conference, the National Institutes of Health featured the NIH Research Zone, a coordinated effort that involved 27 institutes and centers from NIH professional societies and other supporting partners. The NIH Research Zone provided one-stop shopping for teachers interested in discovering the resources available from the NIH research community. Workshops and exhibits on NASA's education programs are also prominent parts of NSTA conferences. These include the NASA Educator Astronaut Launch, where teachers can join NASA's first educator astronaut, Barbara Morgan, on her upcoming shuttle launch. The Student Observation Network, 21st Century Explorer, and the Engineering Design Challenge allow students to use NASA data to conduct their own analyses and apply engineering principles to solve scientific problems. One of the challenges with many federal education programs, however, is that they reach only a minuscule proportion of our nation's science teachers. We must continue to find new and effective ways to get quality professional development programs up to scale so they reach a large number of teachers. To address this issue, NSTA is working with NASA, NOAA, and the FDA to develop face-to-face -face training and online experiences that we believe have potential to reach hundreds of thousands of K-12 teachers. Why is professional development so important? Last year, the National Research Council report titled Taking Science to School, Learning and Teaching Science in Grades K-8 said that professional development is key to supporting effective science instruction in the critical early years of a child's education. All teachers need opportunities to deepen their knowledge of the science content. In fact, the NRC in Taking Science to School report says that federal agencies that support professional development should require that the programs they fund incorporate models of instruction that combine the four strands of science proficiency, focus on core ideas in science, and enhance teacher's science content knowledge knowledge of how students learn science, and knowledge of how to teach science. In conclusion, recent reports have made it clear that better coordination and communication is desperately needed among federal agencies, bureaus, divisions, and centers that are involved with STEM education research and programs. The federal agencies do not appear to work together to facilitate the dissemination of research or to discuss possible new ideas and abo avoid those duplicative programs. In addition, an inventory of STEM education programs across the federal agencies would inform future priorities and initiatives. An oversight entity at the federal level that works to coordinate STEM education programs and could work with state and local officials and with science education stakeholders is critical. Improvements in STEM education require a commitment of leadership at the local, state, and federal levels. 
education programs at the federal agencies should continue to play a role in improving STEM education. We hope that any changes to existing programs, especially at the National Science Foundation, that may come about as a result of this ACC report will be carefully reviewed and considered. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to address you today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Proshaw. Mr. Locke. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me here today to speak to you about this issue. It's an honor to sit before you alongside colleagues who I've worked with and learned much from. We've made great progress with mathematics and science instruction in Chicago. Student performance has risen considerably over the past five years, and our rate of improvement is greater than that of the rest of the state. To do this, we developed a comprehensive plan to coordinate all aspects of mathematics and science improvement, which we call the Chicago Math and Science Initiative. As part of this work, we created a vision for high quality instruction, built a support infrastructure to provide high quality, content rich professional development to thousands of teachers over the course of an academic year, forged partnerships with local businesses, museums, laboratories, and universities to increase the content knowledge of our teachers and enhance their after-school offerings to include mathematics and science enrichment. We've done this in the traditional urban context. Most of our students are poor, our facilities are crumbling, and we're limited on resources. Um, I'd argue that there are two major assets of the federal R&D mission agencies that will help K-12 STEM education. The first asset is human capital. The scientists and engineers of NASA, NOAA, NIST, EPA, and the Department of Energy are the best and brightest in the world. They're the ones making new discoveries, creating new technologies, and literally exploring new worlds. The more we can connect students, parents, and teachers with their insights, energy, and perspectives, the better. The second major asset is the facilities. The laboratories and tools that are part of the federal R&D infrastructure are top notch. The particle accelerators, the spacecraft, the computers, the data sets. Most of our students have a very incomplete picture of the real work of scientists and engineers. Many teachers have never been part of a real scientific project. The facilities that are part of the federal R&D mission agency should be utilized not, not only to ground science learning in a well-defined context, but to enable students and teachers to grasp a vision of what they're trying to do. Communication between districts and the federal R&D mission agencies generally differs by the amount of collaboration that is intended in the partnership. For projects that are designed by the federal R&D mission agencies, uh, individual teachers in schools find them by the usual methods, NSTA mailings and publications, websites, email lists. We regularly email our teachers any opportunities that we hear about. And generally, because of our lack of resources, it's unconscionable for me not to encourage our teachers to participate in anything. For more strategic partnerships, our programs are often developed jointly and are the result of an ongoing dialogue, so the strengths of the partnering institutions are all leveraged. These partnerships require intense collaboration and flexibility from all sides, as well as resources to support and create and maintain them. In my written comments, I've mentioned several partnerships we've used with Fermilab and Argonne National Laboratory. The federal R&D mission agencies have an important role to play in improving K-12 STEM education. By leveraging the human capital and facilities these institutions possess and connecting these to the existing plans and strategies of districts, we'll collectively be able to advance the mathematics and science achievement of our students. Thank you. Like Mr. Nelson. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Pinky Nelson, and uh, today I'm wearing my science educator hat. Uh, what resources can the mission agencies focus on the two goals of literacy and workforce development? They have skilled and knowledgeable workforce of scientists, engineers, and technicians engaged in cutting-edge science and technology development focused on missions critical to the country, research and technology partnerships with industry and universities, world-class and unique laboratories and facilities, and the capacity for long-term funding. What resources do the mission agencies generally lack? 
knowledge of the K-12 education system and how it is structured and regulated, and internal expertise in education research, curriculum development, effective instruction, or teacher preparation. The agency should confine their programs so those that can take advantage of their strengths and be sure to include appropriate partners when working in areas where they lack the expertise. They have the capacity to sustain and grow programs that are working and ax those that are not. Possible areas where I think the mission, a mission agencies can contribute effectively include career pathways for high school students and mission-related undergraduate and graduate research. More challenging is participation in K-12 curriculum development and evaluation and teacher preparation. I'll briefly discuss the areas of challenge before moving on to discuss career pathways and support for research. Working towards achieving universal literacy by improving K-12 schooling requires deep collaboration with professionals across the education system, often in a non-leadership role, creating the, creating the capacity and improving the system comes first. The agency's short and intermediate term goals come second. There's a huge inventory of poorly designed and under-evaluated mission-related curricula, posters and lessons plans and associated professional development, rarely used in classrooms and with no natural home in a coherent standards-based curriculum. The constant barrage of new resources adds to the noise in the system and contributes to the mile-wide, inch-deep problem. However, I do have one positive example. I recently received a copy of an astronomy curriculum for grades three to five that was developed collaboratively by NASA and the professional science educators and developers at the Lawrence Hall of Science and UC Berkeley. It is high quality and fills a real need for instructional materials at this level. A collaborative curriculum development model such as this is rare. Adding the evaluation component could make it exemplary. My current work includes exploring the preparation of effective new STEM teachers and helping current teachers improve their practice. This is not a part-time job or one for the faint of heart. Agencies should encourage and provide incentives for their STEM retirees to become teachers. In addition, they should collaborate with excellent teacher preparation programs and support their rigorous evaluation. In high schools and community colleges, agencies can collaborate with appropriate education organizations and industry to develop and support career pathways for students. For example, in high school, in high need areas like photonics or nanotechnology, the agency can promote its mission through carefully designed, implemented, and evaluated technology programs targeting the future workforce. These programs can take full advantage of the agency talent pool. The NSF Advanced Technology Education Program has created some effective models at the community college level. Agencies could expand this work, bring it to, into high school career and technical education programs, and provide sustaining funding that is not available from NSF R&D programs. Research scientists, engineers, and technicians can help museums or other informal education entities display and communicate, both in real and cyberspace, the new science and technology that is coming out of the agencies to excite and inform students, parents, and voters. Additionally, the personal stories of STEM workers at all levels, including clear maps of the paths through school that qualify them for those jobs, can help motivate students to enter career pathways. Agencies can support undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral students who engage in mission-related research and then hire the best of them into meaningful jobs. They can provide undergraduate and graduate students authentic research experiences in their centers and laboratories, again with the prospect of meaningful jobs. As a graduate student, I spent two invaluable summers at the Air Force Cambridge Research Laboratory Solar Observatory in Sunspot, New Mexico. The NASA Space Grant Program in Washington State is a positive example. NASA funds, leveraged with a one-to-one -one match, support around 150 graduate students every year to engage in STEM research mentored by faculty at institutions throughout the state, internships at companies or NASA centers, or participation on student design teams. Last year, 100% of the Space Grant Scholar graduates went on to STEM graduate work or employment. While the program keeps good statistics, it could benefit from a more sophisticated effort. Thank you all. Look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Mr. Van Ryan. Uh, good morning. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I'm Van Reiner, president of the Maryland Science Center located at Baltimore's Inner Harbor. We have three levels of interactive, hands-on exhibits, a planetarium, an IMAX theater, classroom space, and a program space for live science demonstrations. Each year, we admit 100,000 students attending with school groups to augment their science and math mathematics curriculum. We are a member of the Association of Science Technology Centers, Incorporated. 
we, like hundreds of institutions across the country, employ what is known as informal education as a way to connect people with science and technology. Learning by doing is the basis for our approach. Showing how, rather than stating why, gives visitors the information they need to make informed decisions about how to relate the topic at hand. When we are successful, we go from global to local to individual by giving the facts a better understanding of the topic or how it relates to them, and hopefully a quest for more knowledge. Motivating students to take interest in science, technology, engineering, and math but whether or not they choose to pursue a career in those fields puts science centers in a unique position to spark an initial interest. Collaborations are essential to the success of science centers, and we have a history of collaborating with the federal R&D mission agencies. The longest running collaboration is with NASA. We have co-hosted events with NASA, such as having students participate in televideo conferences with the astronauts aboard the Inter International Space Station and the shuttle, as well as watch a European solar eclipse while talking to NASA Goddard scientists on board a ship in the Black Sea. We have helped to develop after-school astronomy programming and are embarking on a citizen science project to measure the amount of UV radiation that reaches the Earth at Baltimore's Inner Harbor. Scientists from federal agencies participate in our Scientist of the Month program to interact directly with our visitors to discuss current research findings. Other instances with NASA and other agencies are listed in my written testimony. Evaluation of these programs and exhibits have been performed in our institution by us. The accepted practice for informal education institutions such as Aztec members has been to do front end, formative, remedial, and summative evaluations of the program or exhibit by a third party to be sure that stated goals of the project are met. These evaluations are required for our NSF or NIH grants, and we use them for other federally sponsored exhibits and programs. Several of these evaluations are included in the attachments to my written testimony, and I apologize for the length of them. These evaluations are thorough and complete and help us to know if we have met the requirements of the project and if the audience understands the subject presented. We feel that without this evaluation, we would quickly lose our relevancy. Currently, we are collaborating with NASA and NOAA on evaluating a project called Science on a Sphere, the globe identical to the one that Queen Elizabeth II visited at Goddard Space Center last week. We have been asked by NOAA to lead the users group to work with the agencies to develop evaluation methods specifically for the exhibit, as well as the programming that the group develops around the exhibit. This collaboration between NOAA and NASA is unique and should be encouraged. Scientists from the two agencies are working together to ensure that the data presented is clear and meaningful. Increased collaboration between federal R&D mission agencies and science centers can better accomplish the goals of STEM education programs. The dialogue between federal mission agencies should be expanded so that the general public and students can be presented with knowledge in larger and more meaningful ways. We believe that the greater understanding leads to greater acceptance that science is resident in everything we do. It just doesn't happen in a laboratory. Science centers are a resource in every sense of the word and should be viewed as such. We know how visitors react and how to best present scientific discovery and scientific progress to the public. We believe greater utilization of science centers as resources for federal R&D mission agencies is the best way to help raise the level of scientific literacy with the general public, including students. We can and do augment the formal classroom instruction using resources that would be either too expensive or too impractical for the classroom. I believe that federal R&D mission agencies should be required to allocate a portion of their resources to educate the public, as is now required by the National Science Foundation. I thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Reiner. I would mention that there's no need to apologize to this committee for providing additional material and particularly evaluative. Uh, we appreciate the effort you folks have done to evaluate your program effectiveness and valued the information very much. Dr. Weiss. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this hearing. My name is Iris Weiss, and I have spent the last three decades in research and evaluation in STEM education. I would like to share my thoughts on two issues. 
The first is how program evaluation can help the federal R&D mission agencies be more efficient and effective wherever they choose to focus their efforts to increase scientific literacy. And the second is where I believe these agencies should focus their efforts. To date, the federal R&D mission agencies have not had a great deal of success in evaluating their STEM education programs. The same can be said for other federal agencies and for the broader field as well. How could evaluations be improved? First, the designs of proposed programs should be critiqued to determine if the interventions are likely to lead to the desired outcomes and how broad the impact would likely be so programs could be improved before major costs are incurred. To take one example, the Department of Energy offered science teachers summer employment in their research labs. Program goals included deepening participating teachers' knowledge of science and improving classroom practice in their schools. But a design critique would suggest that the program would be unlikely to achieve its classroom impact goal. Few teachers would have the time and expertise needed to develop student activities that were accurate, developmentally appropriate, and feasible to implement with the resources likely to be available. Nor would the participating teachers be likely to have the time to help other teachers improve their classroom practice. A design critique might well have predicted what in fact happened. Teachers appreciated being involved in the program, reported that it deepened their understanding of scientific content and scientific research, but it did not have much of an impact on classroom practice. Similarly, forming of evaluation of pilot programs would help the agencies be more efficient and effective in their STEM education efforts. At the pilot stage, the focus is not on impact, but, whether on whether, but rather on whether the program can be implemented as intended, how it might be improved, or if it needs to be discontinued. There's no question that impact evaluations need to be improved as well, as the just released report of the ACC makes clear. At the same time, I believe that the challenges associated with rigorous evaluations of education programs have not been adequately acknowledged in that report. And in addition, effective evaluations require not only strong research design, but also appropriate outcome measures. Although developing instruments to assess teacher content knowledge and similar goals is not the responsibility of the federal R&D mission agencies, I believe that the lack of appropriate measures will continue to hamper the mission agencies in efforts to increase their program effectiveness. Where should the federal R&D mission agencies focus their efforts to improve scientific literacy? Based on my understanding of the complexities of the K-12 education system and the expertise of these agencies, I believe they should play a relatively small role in efforts to improve the informal K-12, excuse me, in efforts to improve the formal K-12 education system and a larger role in the informal science arena. For example, current evidence suggests that teacher professional development is most effective in improving classroom practice when it is closely tied to instruction. We know that teacher content knowledge is necessary, but it is becoming increasingly clear that it is not sufficient. Teachers also need to learn how to use their instructional materials well, how to figure out what their students understand and where they are struggling, and how to make appropriate instructional decisions based on that information. And teachers need opportunities to apply what they're learning in their own classrooms and to get constructive feedback. The federal R&D mission agencies certainly have the content expertise to provide professional development, but they have only limited understanding of K-12 education, and they are not well positioned to provide professional development that is practice-oriented and sustained over time. For greater and broader impact, rather than developing their own programs, I believe the federal R&D mission agencies should consider making scientists available to serve as content resources for local professional development helping shore up a major weakness of many of those programs. In contrast, I believe the federal R&D mission agencies are very well positioned to make major contributions in the informal education arena along the lines we have just heard. Lack of coherence is not a problem here as it is when we talked about curriculum development. In fact, having multiple pathways increases the likelihood that a large number of people will benefit from the available resources. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. White. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Uh, a fascinating uh, series of uh, perspectives from all of you, and I'm grateful for your insights. Um, I'll begin the questioning, and then uh, five minutes or so we'll yield to uh, One of the, the terms that came up repeatedly in 
Secretary's testimony was with outcomes and the importance of looking at outcomes. Um, what would each of you, and I'll each of you take a shot at this, what would be the most important outcome that you think could derive from participation by the mission agencies in the education endeavor? What, if you had to measure it, and, and I recognize, frankly, some of it's rather ephemeral and maybe difficult to quantify, and I, I respect that. But set aside the, the issue, don't define your goal as, as something measurable, define something desirable first, and we'll worry about measuring it second. What would you think are the most important outcomes, just from left to right, Ms. Froshar? One of the things I believe that would help classroom teachers the most, and that's my perspective, is research that would provide us with information concerning how best to teach concepts to students so that they truly can conceptually develop the ideas. Um, the, the research base in many areas is lacking, and, and expanding that research base would be very valuable. And most of that can be done quite quite well with some longitudinal studies and look at how, how students actually learn over a long period of time and add to their the conceptual understanding. I think what would help most is um, having the federal R&D mission agencies measure the way that they connect students and parents and teachers. Um, to the practice of science through their laboratories and their facilities and the the way that they inspire that same population to get excited about the world of science and its practice. Focus on the informal side. Dr. Nelson. I'd like to see an outcome that that allowed the mission agencies to, to be full partners with the with the schools and the community colleges and programs that, that help prepare not necessarily the, the very high end top 10 percent students are going to be scientists and engineers, but, but help the, the forgotten majority of the students below that who have, who are you know, very necessary. We need three or four or five good technicians for every engineer we've got in the field. And those students need to be uh, both excited to, to participate in a career like that, prepared through a good K to 10 kind of preparation in the schools, but where the agencies can help is to take them that next step through their last couple of years of high school into community college to prepare them to work on the cutting edge in the mission agencies uh, as you know, high paid, well prepared technicians and, and support personnel. Right. Uh, in my arena, or our arena if you will, um, I think the mission agencies have a role to play in terms of exciting not only the students but their parents and the general public because I think that, that we need to improve science literacy. We need to have people understand that science is all around them. I, I have a couple anecdotes that I think uh, apply to that. Dr. Tom Jones, a former shuttle astronaut, has told me that he first became interested in astronomy when he looked through the telescope at the Maryland Science Center as a young child. Also, the current doctor in charge of the Baltimore Public Health System remembers going to a science summer camp at the Maryland Science Center where he dissected a cow's eye, and that gave him his first example of medicine. So we, ha we have that opportunity. I think the federal R&D agencies can help us in terms of getting people, the public students, to relate to the field. I notice in those comments, uh the absolute centrality of hands-on experience, which I know your facility is just really the hallmark of your facility. In both those anecdotes, it was a hands-on experience that excited someone. There, there's nothing like the face of a, of a student who, in interacting with an exhibit, suddenly gets it. Pretty rewarding. Dr. Weiss. Um, one outcome would be student interest in science, the wow factor that you referenced. A second would be general science literacy. We have measured that over time, and it's been pretty um, disheartening uh, what the results have been. And if the agencies choose to work in the formal system, then I would say the outcome would be improvements at scale. Mm -hmm. Having, for example, having science textbooks used by millions of kids have relevant applications as opposed to just um, a small number of people benefiting. The scale issue also is something many of you mentioned, and I think that's a central question, is how do we scale this up? It's, it's terrific if, if 100 teachers or 50 teachers or even only 20 can go to a summer workshop, but how do we scale it to reach the, the forgotten majority that Dr. Nelson alluded to? Um, 
and maybe we'll be able to get to that question uh, in a moment. I, I would just conclude by we had a, a workshop out in my district with uh, NSF and a bunch of teachers, and someone asked at one point, what do you think the goal should be? And, and for me, the essence is, is, as a science teacher myself, actually, before this job, uh, is wonder and discipline. Uh, I want the kids to, and you said the wow factor, I want somehow, and I think what the agencies can do is do the wonder part well. Nothing like talking to a space shuttle astronaut or somebody under the ocean or, or dissecting a cow's eye. That wonder part is critical, but the discipline part that helps them understand, it's, it takes some rigor to answer these questions. And uh, with that, let me yield appropriately to uh, a gentleman who knows firsthand about that, the ranking member. Also acknowledge the presence of Eddie Bernice Johnson, former ranking member of this committee, and a valued asset to it. Thank you. Ms. Reynolds. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the testimony. It's, uh, I'm a hands-on person as an experimental physicist, and I, uh, I'm a great believer in hands-on education as well. Uh, I'm just curious of the, uh, you know, we're talking here about agency, programs, agency ideas. How much of them are directed to the high school student and how much to the elementary school student? Uh, let me just get a, an idea from each of you of what you think it is, say the ratio of high school to, to elementary school. Ms. Proshower? I don't, I don't know that I can give you an exact figure on that. However, I don't expect exactly. <laughs> um, the, there is a great deal more emphasis on high school than there is on elementary school, which we know needs to, we need to have a shift in that. There needs to be more emphasis on elementary school because, as so many people have expressed, when you're beginning in their education, we want to excite students that they actually consider taking more science as they go through the K-12 system. Michael? Okay, Dr. Nelson? I think there's been, it, it, it moves around, it's a moving target. I think recently people have been focused on middle school, you know, which has been kind of a great wasteland of education in terms of, of, of what, the, what the focus and the coherence of the programs there, and it, so it's been getting a lot of attention. Uh, my impression is that it's kind of spread evenly across the, across the board. I think the mission agencies would like to focus on high school. In our case, we force them to um, uh, tailor their content, or, or we tailor the content to upper elementary and middle school. Okay. And Dr. Weiss? I haven't a clue. Okay. That's a perfectly valid answer. I don't either, otherwise I wouldn't have asked the question. Uh, the. Um, Years ago, I, I proposed, and unfortunately, that part of the bill got removed, uh, went through the process. This is when we still had Eisenhower funding, and we had a clearinghouse in Columbus. I proposed that that clearinghouse be charged to have a, have, have a listing, an Amazon.com type of listing of all the different units available from all the different public agencies, from the corporations, uh, the, Chemical Society, et cetera, et cetera. And by Amazon.com style, I mean teachers who used a particular unit would send back their evaluations, you know, one star up to five stars, and tell other teachers how they've used it. So that a, a, a high school chemistry teacher wanting to <coughs> teach something about the gas laws would just go to that website, punch in gas laws. There might be 20 units that would fit. She'd read the evaluations, download the best one for her class the next day. Unfortunately, as I say, that got lost, but I still think it would be very useful. The other thing that it seems to me would be useful in terms of the government agencies uh, is some sort of STEM uh, czar, and I don't mean that literally, but something that coordinates all the different programs because we have an incredible hodgepodge out there. And how is the teacher to sort them out? How, how, are they, how do they relate to each other? How can you effectively use them in the curriculum? And it seems to me that having this listing I talked about plus some, some cohesion, coherence to the federal government's efforts might be very beneficial for all teachers. Uh, finally, let me just make a pitch um, and picking up on what uh, Mr. Reiner said uh, about getting kids excited. I really think you have to start in the elementary school very strongly 
if we're going to get the type of technicians we need, and, and I always say the jobs of the future will require a, an understanding of the basic principles of math and science. I mean, I, I think that's pretty self-evident. So how do we get convey that to the kids? I think you have to start in preschool already, emphasizing these ideas. And I'm pleased I just managed to get attached to the Head Start bill last week that uh, Head Start programs also have to t deal with what we call math readiness and science readiness, just learning simple skills of classification and enumeration, things of that sort. Uh, if we don't get them started early, they're not going to do it in middle school. If they don't do it there, they don't do it in high school, they get to the university and it's too late. They have to spend six years if they want to become an engineer. So I think it's it's crucial that these programs that we they, that we collective we developed for use in schools be able to span the spectrum and really develop the interest. That I'll yield back. I'll yield to Dr. McHerney in one moment, but I'd I'd like to give the panelists a chance to respond to the particular issue Dr. Ayler's raised, which seems intriguing to me. Is there such a clearinghouse as he's described? And if not, would it be useful to you? And in what way would it be most useful? There, there isn't a single clearinghouse for all materials that, that I've ever heard of. Well, there have been some attempts to have clearinghouses for materials, and we cr currently there is nothing. And it is beneficial to have a clearinghouse. Something else that's interesting is that um, currently when programs come out of an agency such as NSF, there's, there can't be any kind of a rating system coming from NSF, actually. They can't put their good NSF stamp of approval on it and say this is what everyone should be using. And so the, it even makes it more of a dilemma as to what really quality programs are out there for teachers to pull from. There's not a clearinghouse that I know of other than a, a web search, which I know many of our teachers use. I would uh, sort of add to the discussion the, um, the one of the sensibilities we've learned in Chicago is that just using curriculum by itself is necessary but not sufficient to get where we need to go. I spend an awful lot of time and energy connecting well-designed curriculum to workshops, to in-school coaching, to assessments, to leadership development work, to grade to grade, school to school uh, sequencing. Um, and I think that part is really, really important. And I would uh, want to make sure any such clearinghouse really highlighted the connections between all the things that a teacher has to worry about. If we make it just a, a place to download a PDF of a gas law experiment, it's not going to be, uh, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient to get the kind of change we need. Other comments on that? Or on the informal science education, the members of the Association of Science Technology Centers do share successful programs, and that and the website of Aztec is a place that you can go. Uh, ad additionally, when we receive an NSF or NIH grant, we are required to share any findings we get with other member institutions, but I know of no other clearinghouse. I'd like to comment on that as well. Uh, some teachers can pull together excellent materials and organize them into a coherent curriculum, but most teachers have uh, neither the time nor the capacity to do that. And in our research, when teachers have been faced with more than they can cover in the time available, they make choices, but the choices tend to be based on what they believe is engaging to their um, students. And a lot of the prerequisites get lost. Uh, the coherent whole of children getting an opportunity to learn important science goes away. So the kind of clearinghouse approach I would recommend would be to make these wow factor types of things available to curriculum developers so they could get into the system at scale as opposed to through the work of individual teachers. Dr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the big challenges we face is that uh, STEM education is hard work. Uh, it's not easy to get a degree in math or, or physics or, or engineering. It takes a lot of hard work. And so part of our job is finding out what it's going to take to inspire 
this coming generation to do that hard work, to get involved, uh, and to, instead of going to the frat party that they want to go to, uh, to actually do the work. And this starts when they're young. Uh, this sort of drive to, uh, to, to achieve something in science or engineering starts when they're young. Uh, and uh, Dr. Van Reiner, um, you had mentioned that uh, you, have you have scientists come in to your uh, science center. Uh, I'm wondering, what is the most effective thing in, in your uh, observation to get kids wowed, to get kids excited and inspired about science? Is it direct interaction with scientists or is it hands-on? Uh, what thing, what works the best? Uh, at, the, at the early ages, it's definitely the hands-on. As, as they get into upper elementary or middle school, it's a combination of the hands-on and the direct interaction. I can remember we had a, a USGS geologist, a young woman who was explaining what she did for her job, and this, this young seventh grader said to her, you really like what you're doing, don't you? And the, she said, yes, and they pay you for that? <laughs> so I, I think that, that's, that's just, uh, I've, I've got a thousand anecdotes, but I, I do believe that it's important for the scientists to have a face-to-face -face time with the upcoming generation, if you will, in order to be able to practice explaining things in everyday language. I'd like to comment on that, too. I, I think one of the issues of the of the pipeline that we don't talk about very often that, that that's really important is we need we need to focus on getting kids in the front end of the pipeline that's certainly true but one of the things I found in working with lots of students and, and trying to convince them that they might be interested in being scientists or engineers or or going to work and even being science teachers is this notion that the pull on the other end of the pipeline isn't that strong a, a lot of times people say well why should I be an engineer it's not such a great job anymore how attractive is it to be uh, to, to get my PhD in biology when I could get my my business degree and then become a, a postdoc for the next eight years and when I'm 40 I might get an assistant professorship job so I think we need we need mm -hmm. to work on the both ends of, of the pipeline to make the, the jobs for students uh, very appealing and the agencies can certainly work on that at the at the front end so that students see this as a possibility. You think back in the 60s when we were going through school and, and the community, the government and everybody else was paying people to go to graduate school. The universities were booming. Uh, everybody who graduated got a, could get a job right away and now we have this huge pool of postdocs and others out there. And so the, the system is different today and I think that that does have, a, that does have an impact. I'll yield back. Ms. Johnson. Okay, uh, we'll go to a second round. This is very interesting and I, I appreciate it greatly. Let's move to the issue of scale a little bit. Because that's something that many of you mentioned and, and uh, uh, the common thread and also Dr. Nelson, you talked about the challenge of, of uh, I want to sort of put out two issues. One is the issue of scale and the second one is the issue of uh, that Dr. Nelson talked about, about apparently NASA just proliferates educational material posters pamphlets, et cetera, but, but lacking some of the direction, the kind of things that uh, Dr. Weiss maybe mentioned. So I'm going to throw out those two topics and, and open it up to I, any of you about either of those topics uh, that you want to address, either how we scale things up or how we watch out for this proliferation of materials that may be well-intentioned but not uh, well-targeted. Dr. Laka, you've got direct experience with some of this and a big scale system. I know a thing or two about scale. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I think that's, um, that's really the key, the, the key point. I mean, a lot of what uh, we've done in Chicago has been based on Iris's work, among others. And I think um, what we found out is um, we may not have all the answers, but we know an awful lot more about how to leverage pretty dramatic change in a large system. It involves coherence. It involves an intense focus on capacity building. It means connecting instructional materials to assessments, to coaching, to support. It means focusing on leadership, and it means pulling everybody in the community together, all the museums, the universities, the labs, you know, to work on this together. And it takes a long time, and 
it takes an awful lot of work. How did you find time uh, for, uh, for, for the people in participating to do this, and how did you get their buy-in in that system? We, we, our work in Chicago um, began through a series of NSF systemic initiative grants. It took us several years to sort of figure out how to use them and how to use them well. Um, and we began with a, we, we knew the need, that need was very clear. We began with a vision that said, this is how we're going to move things ahead. Um, we had 87 different math curriculum in Chicago um, at the K-8 level when we started. Now we're down to two at the K-5 level. Um, in a local control district, that takes an awful lot of convincing and conjoling to do. Um, but other groups would sort of come along once they would see that sort of coherence. Um, and it, it means, you know, tending to your stakeholders. We do, I spend a lot of time and energy making sure that our friends at universities, our friends at, um, at labs and museums understand the role that they are to play and we do a lot of back and forth to make sure that that makes sense. What, what's your portfolio? How did, did, did someone uh, uh, crown you as the, the education, science education czar and then give you some authority that, that, or is it just your persuasive personality that, that gets you through the day? I, I mean, I was, I, was a, I was a classroom teacher um, and uh, had enough of a loud mouth that um, was sent um, to Washington to be a fellow, and then I learned an awful lot from uh, Congressman Ehlers, um, sort of gave me a perspective about scale and about policy that I just didn't have in the, at the classroom level. And um, then when I came back to Chicago, it took a, took a little bit of time, but then they um, had me in charge of science and then science and mathematics. And you're given that respect. People acknowledge that's your role, and they look to you for help, and, and you get to give some guidance and governance, I guess. Yes, um, I will. I, I pause because I think, um, this is, and this is a little bit of a side. I think one of the things we're learning is that instructional leadership in mathematics and science is really, really important, and it doesn't exist very much in the educational system. There's lots of pretty compelling research now that shows principals and school leaders when they lead. The practice of leadership differs around reading and around mathematics and around science. And that's not something that most of the people in you know, most local and state education agencies understand, and I don't think the system quite addresses yet. And that's, it's a really important factor if we're going to leverage the kind of changes we need. Well, we appreciate the work you do. I'm also very grateful to hear that an NSF grant was used so well. Uh, you may be interested to know in our NSF uh, reauthorization bill, which Dr. Ehlers and I uh, wrote together, uh, we've actually lengthened the time period for some of these demonstration projects. It had been th th three years and you're out, basically, so that right when you get things where you've tweaked it enough to think it's finally working and you get the first class of students through, then it runs out. We're, we're going to actually make that longer. It's also nice to know that somebody who works for Dr. Ehlers has done on, gone to do some great things. Not a surprise at all. You learned from the feet of the master. Uh, uh, Dr. Ehlers is recognized. Not sure how I could follow that up. Let me just say that when Michael uh, spent a year in my office, he did a better job of learning how Congress operates than any fellow I've ever had. He had an instinctive approach. And I think what really happened when he got back to Chicago he realized that if anyone can understand how Congress works, they can figure out how the educational system works. Yeah, Chicago. I think it wasn't a factor also that this that you arrived there shortly after the Chicago public schools were so-called privatized, and uh, that resulted in a much greater centralization of authority and power, and that's something you could leverage. Is that correct? Uh, so it's a combination. But you've done a beautiful job there. Uh, let me also ask, uh, answer one other question that I heard raised at some point, um, and I don't recall where or how, but that was about how, how one propagates this. And the best example of that I've seen is the American Meteorological Society offers a summer program for teachers at, I think, at various grade levels. But one requirement of signing up for that course, and it's, it's a very good course, it's about a month or more, and, and the teachers are paid for their expenses, et cetera, and get a stipend. But one requirement is that every teacher, when they go back to their school system, 
have to set up workshops to teach 10 other teachers the same material. And then those teachers have to make a commitment to, to propagate it to their own school buildings. And so in a short time, the AMS curriculum went from being uh, just taught to a workshop and ended up with 100,000 teachers using it. And, you know, it's a subject like that, perhaps it's easier than most to develop a, a concise unit. Kids can study clouds and weather and so forth, so, you know, there's no expense involved with equipment. But nevertheless, I thought that was a brilliant idea and something that, uh, that we might pursue as well. I um, I don't have any other questions popping in my mind at the moment. I just very much appreciate uh, the the breadth of experience represented here and the comments that you've made. I, it's given me a lot of insight of what we should be trying to do legislatively as well and, and to take into account the, the concerns you've raised. But I don't see any way we're going to break it without, as Michael has indicated, uh, our, our, I believe our emphasis has to be professional development because you know, before I came here I worked with a lot of schools and a lot of teachers and I found the teachers wanting to teach science well, wanting to teach math well, but many were scared because they didn't know the subject material. Many others didn't really, they weren't scared, but they didn't know how to tackle it and do it right. And professional development is the only way you're going to deal with that. And that's why the Eisenhower, Eisenhower program was a good thing, even though it didn't always do it well. Uh, but that's something we lost in No Child Left Behind, only because the, <laughs> the mechanisms are there, but the money was never provided. And so we actually lost something going from Eisenhower to No Child Left Behind. That I'll yield back. Did any others want to comment on the issue of scale or the other questions? I, yeah, I'd like to make a quick comment on that, and it relates to, to professional development, too. Is one of the reasons I went back to the university that I went to, Western Washington University, is that it's a former normal school. It prepares roughly 500 teachers a year. And with the, the bulge of baby boomers moving through the system now, we have a real opportunity, I think, to to provide the system with with new teachers, with young teachers, with new ideas. And one of my stated goals at the university is that I've been at this for five years now. I'm giving myself another five years to say in that time, I hope to be graduating teachers from this institution who don't need remedial professional development. We can't always continue with the same model of assuming that the teachers in the schools are not at the level we want them to be. And so we're working working very hard to try and graduate new teachers who know how to how to choose and use the best curriculum that's out there, who know what good instruction looks like and can have a beginning at least level of practice for that, but also really importantly know how to collaborate with their peers and to partner with, with us at the university and others to to improve their instruction focused around the performance of their students. So uh, now I'm starting to focus on, on not just teachers, but the administrators are such a huge role. We're finding in our NSF grant that, that probably the biggest factor on whether a school is making real progress in improving their science education programs is the principal who can either allow it or not allow those programs to happen in principal preparation programs now. Again, we're having a big turnover of principals. We have an opportunity to prepare administrators who understand what good instruction is, who can support professional learning communities of teachers. Um, so hopefully in the future we get our professional development will look differently. We'll be able to ratchet it up to a different level. As the son of a principal who talked a great deal about the challenge of aspiring to be the academic leader of the institution, but being uh, often burdened with the budgeter, disciplinarian, police, uh, liaison, et cetera, uh, I think you're right. The academic leadership provided by the principal is absolutely critical. And uh, I admire the notion that, that we're going to graduate people actually know what they're doing when they graduate. Uh, it's really is, is well put. Uh, well, we, yeah, it's not so much that the other teachers in the field now don't know what they're doing. It's a different world. We've learned a lot in the last 20 years, and we're Hopefully, we're going to get that into the system. Right. Uh, Dr. Weiss, you had some comments. 
Yeah, I want to build on what uh, Pinky just said. Um, a WAG a while back, a number of years ago, said that we're putting teachers out in immediate need of a 50,000-mile tune-up, and that unless we improve pre-service education, we will always be at the point of remediation rather than continuing education. And we need teachers, like all professionals, need continuing education. One of the root causes of the mess we're in, I believe, is that teachers are asked to try and address far too much content. As a result, our preparation can't be as focused as it needs to be. Our professional development can't be as focused as it needs to be. It's scattered resources. A second comment I want to make, for reasons I've never understood, we are doing better in developing systems to support um, teachers and principals in mathematics education than we are in science education. The notion of professional development materials, models and materials that have been carefully crafted, evaluated, and improved, scaffolds the efforts of lots of people and lowers the capacity that are needed to do these well in the field. Building on what Michael said, we need efforts, direct efforts, and I don't believe this is a federal R&D mission um, agency uh, responsibility, but direct efforts to build the capacity so that we people our school systems with people who are ready to take advantage of the knowledge and tools that are out there. I could go on longer, but I'll stop. Very well put. I'm going to yield some time to Dr. Ehlers who has a follow-up question. Uh, thank you for yielding. I, I totally agree with you on, on that issue. And uh, in terms of why science takes second seat to math, I think it's pretty evident. Everyone thinks that reading and math something that everyone should understand. I find a lot of people who still think that science is only for someone who's going to be a scientist or an engineer. And uh, even if they're teachers, they don't regard it as highly important. Uh, that, that's changing, but the way I got into science education was just when I was a young, te young professor and I was very concerned about scientific illiteracy and I asked myself, what can I do as one person and I decided to set up a special course to teach future teachers both science and how to teach science. And I thought that was my role in life until it inadvertently brought me here. Uh, the, uh, that, that's absolutely crucial. And I continue to speak constantly to university presidents, deans, about the importance of this. And above all, and something I learned the hard way, uh, that you have to get the schools of education to work with the academic departments. Right now, almost every cam cam campus I visit, uh, it's not that they dislike each other, they disdain each other. I mean, the academic folks think the, the people in the Department of Education are all the flutter about it, education psychology and theories of education, and they don't know how to teach themselves. And the people in the education department think about the scientists as up in the lofty skies. They don't know, have a slightest idea what it's like to teach in elementary school. They just don't talk to each other. Uh, I, I found I had to teach myself the lingo of the educators, uh, study educational psychology on my own, and so that I could communicate with them. And once that happened, uh, we had a very good relationship and actually worked together. But it is tough. Uh, the, the, the easiest thing to do, easier than professional development, is to have, train the teachers right in the first place. It's going to take a lot of work on a national scale to make that happen. It is happening. You're doing it, Dr. Nelson. Arizona State University has done quite well in it. Kansas has started some good programs. Western Michigan University has. So it's, it's coming and spreading across the country, but it's still not highly regarded in the academic world, and it should be. Thank you. Thank you for those insights, Dr. Aders. Uh, Mr. Carnahan, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to the panel. Um, I apologize for getting here late, but uh, I did want to jump into these questions here. Uh, and in particular, I wanted to talk about uh, any successes that you've seen or ideas you can share with us about how we can do a better job uh, with partnerships uh, between uh, the, the frontline teachers and the private sector and other science resources. I mean, my uh, hometown is St. Louis, and we have a, a wealth of higher institution uh, entities there, higher education facilities there, uh, private sector. 
uh, entities like Monsanto, Boeing, nonprofits like the Missouri Botanical Gardens and the Danforth Plant Science Center. So we've got this wealth of, of science and engineering uh, uh, there in the community, yet we still seem to have a difficulty getting some of that translated uh, into the classroom. And so I guess kind of a two-part question, how can we do a better job partnering with those kind of resources to supplement what we do in the classroom? And the, the second part of that is uh, with regard to uh, streamlining our teacher certification process for some of those retirees that maybe have had uh, full careers in one of those institutions, how they could become uh, qualified to teach and be a part of, of really beefing up what we do on the front line of our schools. And I'd, I'd start with, uh, with uh, Ms. Froshauer. Thank you, Congressman Cunningham. It's good to see you again. Good to see you. And you, as you know, we, were, we recently were in your town uh, yes, for indeed. our major national conference, and we had the ability to enjoy all of those wonderful science resources you just mentioned. Uh, we had about 10,000 science teachers there a couple months ago, so it was it's good to see you. Um, I, want, I do want to say something about the cooperation and working with agencies. Um, I, I know that Dr. Nelson had mentioned that things like posters and things of that sort that have come out of NASA and other agencies are not highly utilized by teachers. But there, there are many partnerships and many collaboratives that have brought about materials and opportunities that have been, been very beneficial to science teachers. But they, they must be done carefully. They must be well thought out. They must be things that are actually going to be utilized by the teachers, are beneficial to the teachers, and translate into student learning. We've partnered, an STA partnered with NASA. And in that partnership, we, we considered what science teachers need. Now, many people have already alluded to the fact that science teachers sometimes are uncomfortable with the content, especially when we get into elementary grades, middle, middle schools many times, and even a high school teacher who may be teaching outside of their, their discipline. We know that that content is necessary. We also know that NASA has the capacity of providing scientists and the people who can actually contribute the content knowledge. And so we utilized that content knowledge, that expertise with NASA, pulled it together into something that would provide teachers with content information. We also know that teachers are busy, and so they want to be able to gain that content information kind of on an on-demand sort of basis. And so we've provided that actually on the web so that they can self-instruct, they can also self-evaluate, and actually can develop that content knowledge. We do that through something called science objects. Um, and they're, they're available free. On Excuse me, is that, a, is that a specific website, Science Objects? If you go into the Nas National Science Teachers Association website, you will find Science Objects. And those are ac that's actually at the front of the wall, in front of the wall, so that um, everyone can have access to them. We've also partnered with NOAA and FDA on pulling together those, those sorts of things. And then during the St. Louis Conference, for instance, we had many sessions that were delivered by uh, NASA scientists, by uh, NOAA scientists, um, and also had they had space on our exhibit floor where they could disseminate materials and share information with teachers. So there are some very strong partnerships when you consider what the needs of the teachers are and what the resources are of the agency and how you can pull those together to benefit teachers. And so you think we do the same type of things with local resources as well? Uh, you, you certainly can. And, and I, you probably already realize that there's um, a great deal of effort right now at the state level to have coordinating bodies established similar to what's being recommended through the NSB Council and also through the, the current ACC recommendations that there would be a coordinating body that would look at all of the efforts that are taking place at a state level and that came out of the governor's report. I guess the second part of my question with regard to uh, potentially cert uh, being able to certify some of those retired experts, engineers, scientists that are in communities like that. Uh, has there been any work going on that has helped facilitate that that you're aware of? Well, the, st 
every state seems to have their way of providing for that kind of certification. Um, there are many opportunities for for people to change a career path and go into science education, and it doesn't always demand that they go back to college for four years to get an education degree. It's actually an alternate path to science teaching, and every state seems to have a different way about going going about that. That that's something else could you really use some coordination because obviously in some situations it's more successful than in other situations. I guess, and I'll. I'll ask this of anyone on the panel, is, are you aware of any, uh, certainly the state uh, certification process varies widely, uh, but are there any, any sort of best practices out there that, that uh, you know, a certain state is doing that we might try to uh, copy or, or other states could look to as a leader in that area? I, one, one of the problems we have in Chicago is the, um, the the way we certify teachers uh, is complicated, it's bureaucratic, and it's not the same as our neighboring states. So I think there is um, possibility for ways to streamline that process and perhaps find some commonalities about what a high school biology teacher or a middle grades science teacher ought to know and be able to, um, to move things ahead. Let me speak a, a moment about your, um, your previous question, which I think is a fascinating one, sort of how do you how would, you, how would you think this through in Missouri and, or in St. Louis? Um, I think it begins by having a clear plan, probably at the state or the, the LEA level. That takes, um, it takes a fair amount of work to put that together and a clear theory of action so you would understand why the different aspects of the plan might result in an, uh, a boost in student achievement. If you have a plan, you can then position the various partners to take on different roles of that. In Chicago, for instance, um, we, uh, a big part of our plan is a core curriculum adoption and implementation. U of C does one of our math programs, UIC does another, Loyola does our science programs. They've become implement, implementation centers within the district to move that along. The second part of our plan is to um, increase the content knowledge of our teachers by taking university courses. We have 10 local universities that we provide tuition stipends for so teachers can go back to school and earn the state endorsement in mathematics or science. Um, we, in our plan, we also have a place for this inspirational, this wow factor. Um, we use our, you know, the tremendous museums that are in Chicago, the Museum of Science and Industry, the Field Museum, Adler Planetarium, others. Um, we use the um, Argonne and Fermi Lab. We use a lot of the community resources to do that, um, that inspiration sort of work. It's only been in the past year or two when we've had this plan and kept with, we've kept with this plan for four years, but it's only been in the past year or two where I've had enough um, political clout to be able to tell someone, you know, those posters that you're providing or those one-shot lesson plans, I don't think we really need that. We've got a plan. It's working. We're sticking to that. Um, but it's very, very difficult to do. Um, we don't have a lot of resources in Chicago. It's pretty unconscionable to turn them away. Um, having a plan, having lots of partners invested in that plan enables us to bring that coherence and that support. And the last part of that um, that I, I also think that um, you might be able to help with is um, we need tools to sustain that, those sorts of plans. Um, and that kind of work. That means a high level of capacity in districts and states for leadership in math and science education and the appropriate amount of political cover so those people can make the kind of decisions that are going to help kids in the long run. Um, it's very, very difficult work. Um, it's really difficult at scale um, and we need lots of resources and help from you all if we're going to give, us, give our kids what they really deserve. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, <clears throat> ask Dr. Weiss a, a somewhat different question. I appreciate the uh, tremendous insights, and then Taylor's, uh, and then we'll open it up for final remarks. If anybody has any burning issues, so there, you'll get it each. If you've got something you just haven't had a chance to say, we'll get to that too. Uh, just a, one fairly brief question, Dr. Weiss. Uh, questions can be brief. The answers often are much longer. But the ACA report talked about the evaluation and the need for whole group design uh, outcome studies. I wonder if you have any. 
I personally had some mixed feelings about that with internal and external validity issues, but I'd, I'd welcome your insights as an expert in this field. There is no question that we need to be doing a more rigorous job of evaluating um, programs. I think that the report ignores or underplays some really key issues. One I mentioned earlier in terms of having um, outcome, measures of outcomes of interest. Another would be when people talk about randomized control trials, they tend, although the report did uh, talk about this, they tend to not realize that we need multiple such studies. That's a program that works in a rich urban, a rich suburban district, you can't just now say it's going to work everywhere else, and that's, that's been um, a problem. But the other is the realities of school districts. If we were going to try and evaluate, let's say, um, a good a set of instructional materials, you would want to have some teachers using it and some other teachers not, and you'd want to do that for a long enough period of time so that you could look at the differences. Teachers need opportunities to learn how to use the materials, practice, get feedback. School districts are not willing to do that. They can't have two simultaneous programs going on and create whole systems around it. And in these days with um, the pressures, all of the pressures on school districts, we're in this not in my backyard. Everybody wants research-based programs, but nobody wants to participate in the research that will generate that knowledge. So I think that um, there's a whole host on theoretical grounds you cannot argue. On practical grounds, you can. Thank you. Dr. Ehlers had a question, and then we'll conclude in a second. Uh, just uh, something I wanted to get on the record. Uh, if, if there's a lack, first of all, uh, I want to ask if there is a lack of coordination among federal agencies the, regarding STEM education programs, how would you recommend solving the problem? How should we coordinate it, and who should be tasked with the coordination? Any ideas on that? I nominate Mr. Lack. I was afraid of that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the need is clearly there. Um, I think uh, what we've found in Illinois is that um, different districts have different needs. So there, I suspect there would have to be some sort of statewide localization to, to, do, to, to address some of those sorts of things. I think um, there also needs to be um, I would, I would encourage that the, the, the work of the, the coordinating, um, this, this coordinating body, I'm not quite sure who it should be. Um, I think I would, an important role might be to provide really formative work to districts and to states to help them get better. I get a report card every year when I see my test scores, um, but changing educational systems, particularly at scale, is, is a very complicated, murky business. And if I had a well-regarded report that told me, based on the inputs I'm putting in, as well as the outputs, what I need to do a little more of, what I need to do a little less of, that would help me organize resources, redeploy my people in a way that would help sustain that sort of program. In Chicago, we'd love that to be really transparent. Um, we don't have anything to hide. We think we're doing pretty well, but we know we have a long way to go. So some sort of public report card about both the inputs and our outputs, which are already public, I think would help us improve and would help make sure that mathematics and science were really on the agenda of everybody as we move things forward. Anyone else want to respond, Dr. Weiss? I think we need um, research that's focused on a smaller number of problems of practice. That right now the research enterprise, um, it's pretty wide open. And so it doesn't tend, we don't have mechanisms right now for accumulating knowledge on key problems. Um, Mr. Carnahan talked about best practice. We don't really have mechanisms now for knowing. I thought about the question of where are the good lateral entry programs, and I suspect I know the parameters of what an effective approach would be, but I don't have any data, and I don't know that anybody has pulled that together. So we need mechanisms for accumulating knowledge, but we also need incentives for using that knowledge. I was struck by the comment in the ACC report that they saw no examples of a federal agency building on the knowledge or models of another federal agencies. So I think it's capacity issues, but it's also incentives issues. Who, who do you think would be the best 
agency or person to coordinate all that. <laughs> Every candidate that comes to mind has baggage, so I, nothing is, is quite coming to mind right now. The distinguished ranking member would be an outstanding choice. <laughs> if I could make one comment on that. I remember back in the, must have been the late 80s, there was a group called the Fix-It Committee, the Federal Co Coordinating Committee on Science and Technology. Yeah. Or, and uh, it started out with great promise, I think, because it was supported at a very high level from many of the different agencies in the federal agencies, and uh, then kind of petered out as the as the level of participation filtered down and deeper into the organizations. And it, it seems like a, a, a committee like that that could work at can stay at a very high level and and provide a focus and some, some level of coordination supported somehow by Congress or <laughs> some way. Yeah, that's what you guys are good at, right? And, uh, would, would be able to maintain that focus rather than, than, than expecting that to, to uh, you know, if you could keep a committee like that going for long enough, you might be able to bring some kind of a coherence and focus to the program. Any other comments? Well, thank you very much. you are back. I, I just, uh, if, when we have time in an outstanding group like this, uh, would open it up. If anybody has, uh, among you, has any critical insights or issues that we haven't had a chance to address through our questioning that you feel would be uh, a, a shortcoming if we didn't, Grace, let me give you that opportunity now. You don't have to, but if you feel like there's something that really we should put down. I have a brief comment about research that I'd like to make is, is that there's no doubt that if you have a, a controlled laboratory, laboratory condition or you can you can uh, do controlled experiments like double blind drug testing things that 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 is a great way to learn things but as a as a research astronomer i can tell you somehow astronomers learn things <laughs> and we can't control anything right and so it, it is possible by posing questions well and by by doing a careful, carefully designed observations and analysis. It is it is possible to learn important things about complex systems, and so uh, my, to make the point that that we can learn important things about the education system by carefully uh, by designing and carrying out careful observations and analysis of existing systems that then we can apply. So. Not all research has to be fit into this. this. I, I think that's a great example and a, a maybe a, a way of an appropriate analogy that would be we've seen some star uh, programs ourselves today <laughs> and we didn't necessarily need to double blind the study to observe the effectiveness of those stars. Certainly they're important. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, uh, suggest that we were kicking around it in, as this hearing moved forward. I think there's so much information that's been useful today that what we are going to do, we will have a, we've already scheduled a hearing with the, the mission agencies themselves for June, June 6th. We will provide the heads of those agencies with the testimony provided by you folks today because I think it's so outstanding and I would hope they would incorporate the insights uh, in, in their own uh, work on the educational front. We're also exploring the idea of possibly posting this hearing, and, and uh, Ms. Froshaw, we might want to talk to you about posting this hearing in some way where it would be accessible to your members. Uh, they could share some of the models they've heard about how, for example, the science museums are working, how the graduate education programs are working, how uh, Chicago is making its change, how they might design their research interventions, and then offer comments uh, analogous to the kind of approach that Dr. Ehlers was talking about so that we could actually get further uh, impact of your profound insights, but also maybe some additional people pitching in uh, and create a little bit of a dialogue in that way we have this tool. So we will, if we may, talk to you about if there's a forum to do that, a bulletin board kind of model or, or something like that. Without any final comments on your part, Dr. Evans? <laughs> he said we could put it on YouTube and the students. Well, I mean, we do have this extraordinary tool right now. I was saying to Dr. Ayers when I was teaching psychology, uh, came up with a pretty neat way to, to teach about uh, standard deviations, little lab experiments you could do, published it in the Journal of uh, Teaching a Psych, if I remember. And, but gosh, that's a rather inefficient way. It's a nifty little thing, and it worked, I think. And, and 
hopefully some people adopted it and used it, but with the, with the Internet, you can get those things out there so well if there's a coherent way of, of using it. And so we're going to try to model that through, through this hearing itself. With that, I want to thank uh, our witnesses and our guests today and uh, the ranking member and the staff for all their work and look forward to continued dialogue. And I, I'm confident this will actually have some positive impact and appreciate very much your time and expertise. And the hearing stands adjourned. Thank you very much.